Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue, as today we talk about the integration of bispecific antibodies into the management of multiple myeloma. We have a great faculty today to discuss this exciting topic, Dr. Hans Lee from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and Dr. Saad Usmani from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. We have uh, some additional investigator faculty who participated in a survey that we'll show you later. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As always, we have a one-minute pre- and post-survey for uh, you to take. If you take that, you'll get a little more out of the meeting, and we'll learn a little bit about you. We do webinars all the time. On Thursday, we're going to talk about ER-positive metastatic breast cancer, a really hot topic at the recent ASCO meeting. Uh, and then next week, uh, on Tuesday, we'll continue our Meet the Professor series on soft tissue sarcoma. And also, we're going to do a, a review of recent data sets in hepatocellular cancer on Thursday of next week. We'll be coming back talking about a really hot topic in oncology, uh, hormone-sensitive non-metastatic uh, prostate cancer, including the big Embark study on uh, July the 31st. And well, bispecifics is hot in a lot of ways. We have another program coming up on bispecific antibodies in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And we can contrast what we hear tonight to what we hear for that program. And then on August 8th, we have a program on metastatic pancreatic cancer. We're talking about some interesting new data sets from ASCO. We know a lot of people end up listening to replays of our webinars. If you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series, including a recent program with Dr. Lalbach. Uh, on myeloma. But today, uh, this is part of our Inside the Issue series. Uh, and as I do with all of these series, I met with each of the faculty uh, actually this past week to record an in-depth presentation going through a bunch of uh, papers and uh, new trials. And the idea is to check out those two and, uh, and then we'll see what we talk. We're in the webinar here. We're going to try to take things to the next level. But these two fantastic presentations go through a lot of new data sets. And also, both of the faculty present some great cases, and we're going to try to talk about a few of those later on in this conference. Here's where we're heading today. We're going to start out talking a little bit about sort of the biology and pharmacology of immunotherapy and myeloma. Then we'll look at some of the new data sets, although, again, if you want to really get a look into it, check out the presentations. Then we're going to show you a survey we did of the faculty, including these uh, additional investigators, about what they usually do in their practice. And then we'll finish up looking at new trials, combinations in particular, even combinations of bispecifics. And if we have time, we'll get into a few of the cases that are presented. But uh, Hans, I just want to start out and just kind of get everybody on the same page about how these therapies work. And uh, maybe you can comment a little bit about what BCMA is and why it is that it's being targeted, not only with bispecifics, but also CAR-T. Yeah, thanks, Neil, for um, having me on the program uh, today. And it's really great to be here and talk with uh, Saad and you about bispecific. So uh, BCMA stands for B-cell maturation antigen and really emerged as an important target in multiple myeloma over the last five to 10 years has been clinically valid validated in both CAR-T, bispecific, and other immunotherapies. I think what makes BCMA a particularly good target in multiple myeloma is that it's relatively exclusively expressed on mature B lymphocytes, particularly plasma cells, little expression on other hematopoietic tissue and non-hematopoietic tissue. And it also has biological relevance as well. So basically upon binding, uh, most commonly by, by April, less uh, to lesser extent BAF, um, basically this activates a cascade of signals that leads to the growth and survival of long-lived plasma cells. So not only is it just an antigen target that's expressed on myeloma cells, but if you inhibit um, or if you target BCMA, it also leads to the suppressed growth of plasma cells as well. So Asad, a quick question from the chat room. Actually, kind of, we're going to get into some of this uh, with the survey, but the uh, question is, would you use a, a, a BCMA bispecific S for somebody who uh, had a uh, prior CAR T therapy, BCMA CAR T therapy, and if you did, would you lean towards using, a, if you could, a non-BCMA bispecific? 
so, you know, the answer is it depends. Um, you know, I'm comfortable using bispecifics in a post BCMA CAR T patient. Um, if the relapse occurred more than six months after the BCMA CAR, where, you know, the relapse may be a result of, you know, the CAR T cells not persisting, um, I would be okay with using the, the BCMA bispecific. Uh, because BCMA is not an antigen that myeloma cells uh, uh, lose. You know, it's it's more you know evol- from an evolutionary standpoint something that that stays with the uh, vast majority of patients. You know, mutation or downregulation is not something known as um, you know a common uh, way of uh, uh, resistance. Um, however, if the relapse is less than six months or so, you know, I would rather utilize a non-BCMA, um, you know, target for that kind of patient if they did not have, you know, a good response or progress through within the first few months of a BCMA car. Interesting. So, uh, Saad, just to continue uh, our look at sort of the biology of what's going on, can you kind of explain what a bispecific antibody actually is and kind of from the point of view of a molecular point of view, how it differs in terms of compared to, say, CAR T therapy? So it's, it's the poor man's CAR T, you know, in, in some ways. So, you know, I think the, the, the idea of the bispecific antibody, you know, um, or the bispecific construct is that one, uh, part of, uh, that construct recognizes a surface antigen that's, uh, commonly expressed on the cancer cell. And the other one can be targeted to any innate, uh, immune cell. In this case, it's, uh, you know, the T cell, which is so, so the, you know, target we use is CD3. And, uh, you know, we can use BCMA or GPRC5D or FCRH5 for myeloma. Those are the three, uh, antigens or surface antigens that have been, uh, examined, um, in myeloma so far. Uh, BCMA is, is the one that's there from the very beginning and, and responsible for the maturation and proliferation of mature B cells and plasma cells. So, uh, Hans, you know, it's interesting that there are some non-BCMA targets as well. First, uh, GPRC5D. Can you explain what that is and why it's being targeted? Yeah, so GPRC5D has emerged as an important target in myeloma over the last five to, five to seven years, uh, largely wor- uh, from work done by Eric Smith when he was at Sloan Kettering uh, through some profiling studies. And so, uh, you know, this is ex- uh, also uh, nearly exclusively expressed on plasma cells or myeloma cells. Uh, but there is some other expression of GPRC5D on hair follicles and keratinized tissue, which may explain some of the on-target, off-tumor adverse events seen with GPRC5D targeted therapies. Uh, one thing that's uh, different about GPRC5D compared to BCMA is that there's no known extracellular peptide uh, shed by the myeloma cells of GPRC5D. So one concern with BCMA is that there's something called soluble BCMA, which can act as an antigen sink with BCMA-targeted therapies, but that does not seem to be the case with GPRC5D. So we'll get into this later if we get to the cases, but Saad, maybe you can just comment on some of the sort of off-target or I guess on-target effects that affect other tissues and clinically what kind of side effects you see with these uh, agents? Um, so I think, you know, uh, with BCMA, um, it's mostly, you know, the, uh, the, the immune system, um, uh, cells that actually express BCMA. So, you know, primarily B cells and plasma cells that, that, um, you know, we're really worried about. So it's really the infection risk that ends up, um, you know, being, uh, you know, the, the common one. Uh, with GPRC5D, however, you know, skin and nail changes as well as taste and weight, uh, you know, uh, issues, um, uh, are, are a key concern. So GPRC5D is, uh, you know, expressed, um, in the skin and nail bed as well as, you know, in, in the mucosal membrane. And that's where, you know, the, the issues arise. So Hans, uh, you also talked about FCRH5. They have to come up with some better nicknames for these uh, generic <laughs> names. But anyhow, can you explain what FC, FCR, I'll call it FCR just for short, uh, what that target is and what, what we know about bispecifics and also this issue of sort of uh, one target toxicity. Yeah. So FCHR5 also highly expressed on, 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 
plasma cells and myeloma cells. And so has emerged as an important target, primarily in the form of sevastamab, which is a FCHR5 targeting bispecific. And you know, there has been other um, trials looking at FCHR5 uh, targeting immunotherapy constructs, such as an ADC, which did not show actually much efficacy in the past. So uh, I think um, it's, it seems like relatively a clean target, but you know, we're still learning a lot more about FCHR5 through you know, the Savasimab trials in terms of um, other potential adverse events. But uh, you know, it's it's a good target because it's again expressed primarily on plasma cells and myeloma cells. So um, before we look at specific data sets, maybe just to take a little of a broad view. So this uh, slide is, a, I guess, a summary of the uh, of available or the the bi BCMA bispecifics currently under study. The two in gray are no longer being evaluated. Anything, any a broad perspective you want to uh, provide, uh, Saad? on these agents, the differences uh, between them that, uh, from your point of view, are important? I think that one of the key, you know, differences is in the route of administration as well as frequency, and that speaks to the differences in those constructs um, and their half-lives. Um, so that's, that's the most important, um, you know, difference we see. And I think this will be clinically relevant. Um, the other thing that, that I find, you know, very interesting is the response rates are somewhat similar, you know, uh, with each of these constructs. Uh, so is, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, the, the CRS, uh, rates and, and the low neurotoxicity signal. Um, each of these are, you know, small data subsets. So, you know, it's, it's hard to compare them, you know, uh, amongst each other. But, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the Linvo um, construct may actually have, a, a, you know, it appears to have, uh, lower, um, you know, overall CRS rates compared to the others. So uh, Hans, uh, Jack in the uh, chat room wants to know about bispecific T cell engagers and whether they're more effective than bispecific antibodies. What is a bispecific T cell engager, Hans? Yeah, so bispecific T cell engager, I think, are used uh, interchangeably with bispecific T cell antibody. Is bispecific T cell engager, uh, otherwise uh, known as a bite, um, is a trademark term by Amgen. So. AMG 420, for instance, or AMG 701 were both BCMA bytes, um, uh, again, trademarked. And so I think we typically use these terms interchangeably, whether they're engaged or an antibody. So, okay, that's very helpful. Uh, again, this is sort of an overview. We talked before about non-BCMA. Uh, Saad, anything you want to add to what we said before? Again, kind of contrasting uh, these uh, various agents. Uh, none of which are currently available, and also your thoughts on which one is likely to become available in the near, in the immediate future. I think in the immediate future, you know, we, we'll probably hear uh, about telketamab, uh, you know, potentially getting a regulatory nod, um, uh, you know, in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, that's the farthest along, uh, essentially. Uh, it is a subcutaneous formulation, and, and the dosing is different for the every week or every other week. Um, the responses were quite impressive. Um, um, however, you know, this is where you see the, the skin issues. Uh, the second construct, um, you know, uh, that is currently in clinical trials a little behind telketamab, uh, uh, that looks a little bit interesting. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering, you know, whether, uh, given the fact that that construct actually has two binding domains for GPRC 5D, that we might actually see uh, a deeper response and maybe can play around with the schedule a little bit more to give it less frequently to patients. So Hans, uh, we talked about the nail and skin issues, but also, uh, I guess, GI problems, dysgeusia, uh, which we've seen with talcotamab, and I, I think uh, we have that in one of the cases, but I'm curious about your experience with uh, dysgeusia, when you see it, uh, what other kind of GI issues you see, Hans? Yeah, so um, we actually were not involved with any of the uh, talquitinib clinical trials at, at MD Anderson, so it's only available on, on clinical trials. But you know, typically it's seen, um, you know, as people uh, continue to get dosing, you know, two to three months, four months into getting uh, 
the GPRC 5D targeting therapies, and typically is managed uh, by dose delays um, or reductions in the frequency of dosing. Uh, and you know, for instance, um, the hand foot toxicities can be managed by steroid creams, moisturizers, and things like that. And so it does seem to be dose dependent and dose frequency dependent as well. So uh, Saad uh, Hassan in the chat room wants to know, is there, uh, can you comment on, is there such a thing as CAR-T directed against non-BCMA and also allo CAR-T? Uh, so we do have uh, GPRC5D directed uh, CAR-Ts uh, in clinical trials. And, you know, the first, um, you know, homegrown GPRC5D CAR, again, that was, you um, developed by Eric Smith here at MSK, and, and the trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year with my colleague Shamail and Cody being um, the first author. Uh, and that construct is now being further developed, uh, you know, uh, in, in trials by BMS. Um, so, you know, we, we saw some early data at ASH and ASCO um, around that experience, and the data looks, you know, uh, very impressive, you know, with, um, and the overall response rates, all patients responding in the relapse refractory, uh, you know, um, uh, setting. Um, and then, you know, we do have, um, allo car constructs, uh, with targeting BCMA. So we don't have, you know, any non BCMA targeting allo cars. Uh, but, you know, we haven't seen any updated information about uh, that construct, um, in about a year or so. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there, there was a little bit of a concern around, uh, the inherent infection risk with that approach because, um, you do have to get an, uh, give an anti CD52 antibody, uh, along with the preparative regimen before giving that product. Anything you want to add to that, Hans? Yeah, I think that um, non-sort of BCMA targeting CAR-T therapies are, are exciting. I think one of the advantages of targeting GPRC5D through a CAR-T approach is that potentially the toxicity may be more limited because it's a uh, one-time dose of GPRC5D targeting cells rather than continuous dosing with the GPRC5D targeting by specific. So and from a toxicity standpoint, it's something potentially that could be a better tolerated approach uh, than continuous dosing. So uh, another question, Saad, from the chat room from Rebecca. This really gets an important concept that we want to talk about. Can your cases get into it? She wants to know, is there any evidence supporting the idea of extending the time between injections, either to reduce the occurrence of toxicity or maintain uh, patient well-being? And, you know, particularly related to the issue of infections that we're seeing, Saad, any thoughts about uh, what she's bringing up, extending a time between injection or even time-limited therapy as a way to avoid toxicity, particularly infections? Any thought about that, Saad? No, certainly. Um, so I had presented the uh, teclistumab experience from the Majestic 1 study where, um, you know, during that, you know, phase 1 uh, dose escalation, uh, dose expansion study, um, after patients had achieved a sustained response, uh, you know, we would uh, go to every, you know, we were given the option to go to every Q2 or Q, you know, subsequently Q4 week dosing for patients. And what we saw, um, you know, in that um, you know, experience is uh, a reduction in grade three infections by, you know, almost half compared to patients who continued, um, you know, to get weekly dosing um, after having, you know, achieved that response. So, um, uh, you know, based on that information, you know, in our clinical practice right now, uh, once patients have gotten to an optimal, you know, or, or you know, response plateau, uh, for a couple of cycles, we start giving them less frequent dosing to mitigate that uh, infection risk. Hans, any comments? Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, again, um, the less frequent dosing seen with several different bicyclic clinical trials targeting BCMA, and of course, the less frequent dosing seen and the duration of response seen uh, with longer follow-up with the Majestic 1 uh, study and the uh, Magnuson 3 study is quite encouraging. So I think this really speaks to the durability response after stopping therapy in hopes of restoring humoral immunity and uh, basically mitigating the risk for infection. Yeah, I find it really interesting how uh, you know, academic centers sort of modify their protocols as they go along. And we have a slide of, of uh, what Memorial is doing in that respect in uh, just a, a second. Let's talk a little bit about some of the data. We're not, again, your presentations really go through it comprehensively. 
We were talking about the Majestic One trial side. Um, maybe you can comment on that. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we did a program last fall where we actually uh, did uh, video interviews uh, with patients with myeloma. And uh, I happened to interview a, a patient who'd been on teclistamab for a year and a half, having a great response, um, no toxicity, just sort of cruising along. And the day that I interviewed him was the day that teclistamab was approved. And I was just thinking, you know, it's a real, you know, it's different to be in clinical trials nowadays than in the past when you rarely benefit. And here was a patient who'd been benefiting for a year and a half before the drug was ever approved. Anything you want to say about these data? Obviously, the response rate is very impressive, uh, Saad. Anything, any, uh, you go through the trial in great detail in your presentation. Uh, anything you want to say also about the issue of when you see CRS and how you manage it, uh, Saad? So certainly, I can comment on the CRS. So, you know, if you look at uh, the CRS pattern, you know, it tends to happen in about 70 odd percent, uh, you know, of the patients. And if you look at the breakdown, you know, most of that happens with the first two step up doses. And out of that 70 odd percent, 50 odd percent is grade one CRS. Uh, and what is grade one CRS? It's a fever, which can be managed with acetaminophen and, and supportive care. So I think that's the big advantage of bispecifics over CAR T cell therapies, especially, you know, in communities that do not have access to transplant cellular therapy programs. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we need to do, you know, a good job in uh, educating our, our colleagues in the community um, so that, you know, they can learn how to manage, uh, you know, the bispecifics in real time. And uh, that really gets into management of CRS also, uh, Hans, and I'm curious uh, how you approach it, whether the variations in it, uh, do you, uh, you know, do you need to have tocilizumab available? Uh, what are some of the ways you think about managing CRS, uh, Hans? Yeah, so as Saad mentioned, you know, most CRS with bispecifics is grade one, which is just a fever and, and treat with acetaminophen. I think one of the questions is uh, the timing of tocilizumab administration when CRS does occur. And so I think there's been a general trend towards earlier usage of tocilizumab when CRS does occur to uh, decrease the duration of CRS and potentially mitigate the recurrence um, of CRS. So there's some data showing that if you know, giving tocilizumab for CRS could mitigate CRS for subsequent doses as well. And so um, certainly, you know, if a patient had uh, grade one CRS lasting uh, two to three days, I would definitely consider giving tocilizumab again to mitigate the duration. And then, you know, alternatively, um, in some situations where uh, tocilizumab is not available, then, you know, considering giving dexamethasone and corticosteroids could be another option. But I think typically tocilizumab is uh, the first choice of our, of in our practice. I would also mention that there's certainly been, um, uh, some investigation of tocilizumab prophylactically as a pretreatment prior to bispecific uh, antibody therapy. And so there's some data now with sevastamab presented at ASH last year and some data with teclistamab presented at ASCO um, this past month uh, showing that the incidence of CRS does seem to be reduced by giving tocilizumab as a premedication. Although there's still um, a number of grade two events seen despite uh, the pre-administration tocilizumab. So I think really trying to figure out ways that we can really limit even the grade two events, which need supplemental oxygen uh, and intravenous fluids potentially uh, uh, that require more hospital care uh, is really important uh, area of research in bispecific antibody therapy. So much going on in myeloma and oncology. I, I was just thinking back, if, I feel like that interview with the patient was two, three years ago. It was last November when teclizumab was approved. And of course, the biggest question that I started hearing immediately, I was hearing it before it was approved, and Jack in the chat room are, has just asked that, uh, can teclizumab uh, be given by community oncologists without hospitalization? Before we kind of get to that, I'm, I'd like you to talk a little bit. This is really fascinating to me how you at Memorial sort of adapted the way very quickly and in less than a year, how you're using teclistamab. Can you kind of go through that, Saad? No, certainly. So, you know, I, you know, again, you know, having been involved with teclistamab from cohort one, patient one, um, you know, I've, 
Um, I was quite familiar with, uh, you know, its clinical activity and, and, and you know, CRS patterns. Um, so when, when we did get, um, you know, the commercial approval, uh, the one thing that we wanted to see is, you know, is our real world patient population seeing the same, uh, you know, uh, safety pattern? Uh, and if if we are, then, you know, let's figure out a way of, of giving patients the therapy in the outpatient setting. Um, and so, you know, if patients, um, you know, uh, manage the step up dosing, you know, without, uh, you know, high grade CRS, then we started to institute the early discharge. And now, you know, for, for patients who, um, you know, are, um, in a good performance status, do not have high burden of disease that would require hospitalization for other reasons. Uh, we've started to give all outpatient dosing, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it's important to appreciate that, uh, you know, we still monitor these patients closely because we have um, an outpatient transplant set up so we can actually, you know, see these patients at the drop of the hat. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, so so we, we're doing this in the context, context of having the resources needed to monitor these patients in the outpatient setting. So, and you know, well, you know, when or if uh, community-based oncologists can use that kind of algorithm, who knows? But the fact that you're doing it, I think, is encouraging that maybe at some point uh, this can be part of typical community practice. Hans, we talked a little bit about I don't know if you call it Linvo, but uh, uh, maybe you can comment on this other BCMA bias. You made a couple of comments about it. You went through it in your talk. Anything else you want to say about this uh, interesting agent? Yeah, I think a, a couple of things about lindosultamab that are a, a little bit more unique compared to the other bispecifics. One, it's, it's given intravenously. Uh, and so there's pros and cons of giving bispecifics intravenously versus subcutaneous administration. Uh, I think one of the potential advantages of IV administration include the fact that the kinetics of CRS tend to occur earlier. So typically, the median onset of CRS occurs within 24 hours, and the duration is also uh, shorter as well. So this then lends to itself to have less hospitalization uh, for CRS monitoring. And so for this uh, LINCRAM in one study, only a 24-hour hospitalization was required for the first two step-up doses on week one, day one, and on week two, day one. Uh, the other aspect of this particular uh, trial was that um, dosing frequency was, uh, was uh, reduced actually fairly early on in a response-adapted approach. And so in the 200 milligram cohort, by cycle number six or week 24, if a patient had a VGPR better, then patient went to every four-week dosing, which is more convenient uh, for the patient. And I think finally, um, what also is, uh, seemed interesting about this uh, drug, which Sada alluded to earlier, is that the CRS rates numerically seem to be a little bit lower uh, with lymphoceltimab compared to the other bispecies, although there is some caution about doing cross-trial comparisons in this regard, because again, there are small studies, but that signal is encouraging with this drug. We also talk about l ranadentumab That's why you do l because it's not too good by the time I get to the end of it. But uh, uh, Hans, anything, again, we talked a little bit about it. Anything, here's some of the data. Anything else you want to add to this? I guess the sub-Q administration is a, an interesting aspect of this. Any thoughts about that, Hans? Yeah, so the schedule of step-up dosing is pretty similar to, to clostamab uh, with the escalation uh, done uh, within the first week um, of ELRA administration on, on uh, day one, four, and seven. I think uh, one of the uh, aspects of this particular uh, trial that was a little different than teclistamide was that the hospitalization requirement, the built-in hospitalization requirement in the protocol was a bit less than that of teclistamide, so only 40-hour hospitalization uh, on the week one, day one dose, and then uh, only a 24-hour hospitalization on the uh, second dose, no hospitalization thereafter. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, this is currently under regulatory review of what the hospitalization requirements will indeed be for L-Rantamab, you know, if it does get regulatory approval, if it will be potentially less than that of teclistamab, which from a practical standpoint, which would be uh, nice to see. Uh, Saad, any comments? No, I, I don't have any additional comments. Uh, it um, appears what about and I are agreeing with most things. Yeah, that's, uh, well, you're on the same page. And we talked also about telquetamib. Uh, any other comments about that, Hans? 
Yeah, I think the the Talquitnib data was uh, very encouraging. You're seeing response rates of north of 70% in heavily pretreated patient uh, uh, populations. Uh, and I think what was also very encouraging is that we saw responses in patients with prior T cell redirection. And so uh, responses uh, over 50% with patients with prior T cell redirecting therapies, uh, including those that target uh, BCMA CAR T and BCMA by specifics. And so I think this really points to the fact that GPRC 5D can be used uh, following BCMA targeted therapies uh, and patients that progress on such therapies. So I want to get into the, uh, in a second, the survey we did of the faculty who have some very interesting uh, outcomes. Before we do, both of you uh, put together slides in your presentations. I'd like you to briefly comment on, on how you see the pros and cons of using these agents. Saad, here's uh, your slide. Can you comment on the way you're sort of looking at this? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the first part of, you know, the pros really highlights the advantages uh, for our community colleagues. I think that the con part, you know, the cons part is is really the challenge we have. And, you know, we, we know these drugs work. Now let's try to figure out, you know, how to give them safely you know, in the community and, 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 you know, and that data will come from the real world. So that's where, you know, the, the, the con part comes in. Uh, we know that not every patient responds to bispecifics and, and we're trying to figure out how to, you know, best maximize, uh, you know, that, that response. And then we already talked about the infection risk. Um, you know, uh, I think the other piece, obviously, you know, is the logistic challenge for our community colleagues to manage patients in the outbreak, you know, in, 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 you know, with the resources they have uh, during that first month with, uh, you know, the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Um, uh, I think, you know, both CARs and bispecifics are going to have their place in the schema. It's, um, you know, it's just going to be, you know, probably different patient populations. So, uh, and uh, this is your slide. And one of the things that you commented on when we were chatting that I think it's really important to think about, Hans, from the point of view of sort of a disadvantage is really the advantage of CAR-T being, one, quote, one and done, and you're giving these patients some time off therapy. Any comments, uh, again, on, you know, sort of how some of the key advantages and disadvantages you see that Saad didn't comment on, and particularly the uh, disadvantage of having a continuous therapy as opposed to CAR-T? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing still unprecedented responses and depths of response for an off-the-shelf product with the bispecific therapies. And so as we get more real-world data on de-escalation of dosing and actually also fixed duration dosing, it may not necessarily be, you know, continuous or bispecifics and just one and done for the CAR-T, but perhaps a hybrid approach with bispecifics where a patient perhaps will get a therapy for six to 12 months, get a very deep response and potentially could stop therapy altogether. And so, um, you know, perhaps it could be not a necessarily one and done, but several and done for bispecifics. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe that's an, that's an avenue of research for, for the future of, of trying to optimize the dosing, dosing frequency and also mitigation of side effects, uh, down the road, like infection that we're all concerned about. So I uh, actually have another question in the chat room about eligibility for CAR-T versus bispecifics, elderly patients, cardiac or pulmonary problems, how do they evaluate it, patients with Parkinson's. Uh, we'll get into that because we actually have uh, some of those things are dealt with in the clinical investigator survey. Uh, so I want to just sort of go through with this with you. This is our way of doing cons our guidelines and consensuses which is uh, we ask people, well, what do they do in their practice, investigators? And uh, they all say the same thing. We call it a consensus. If they th say three or four different things, we go, well, it doesn't look like there's a consensus. But it gives you a little bit of granularity, at least, you know, about how people are thinking about things. We know, of course, that, uh, you know, you individualize it based on the patient and, and at many of the clinical scenarios. But uh, here's a question we ask, which is uh, how would you compare anti-tumor activity of BCMA-targeted antibodies to a BCMA-targeted CAR-T. Hans, uh, looks like there's unanimity with uh, thinking that CAR-T has a greater uh, anti-tumor activity. Of course, this is indirect comparisons, but uh, what are some of the key uh, th numbers you think about on both sides of the equation, uh, Hans, and why is it that everybody's saying BCMA-CAR-T, and is this is really about cell? 
Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with, I think a lot of people are talking about cell to cell. Uh, I, I'm, at least that's what I was thinking about. I don't know if you're thinking about Saad, but I think, uh, I think the efficacy with cell to cell is quite impressive. You know, uh, longer follow up, um, showing a median progression for so 35 months is really unprecedented in patients with heavily pretreated triple class refractory multiple my- myeloma. I would say when you look at the teclistamab and IDASL data, I think if you look at the PFS and duration of response, it's actually fairly similar as my, as what my take is. And so uh, I think, it, you know, when looking at uh, IDASL and teclistamab, again, more similar results, I think I'd also mention that, you know, of course, with CAR T therapies, um, there's a, a bias probably towards taking less patients with really, really rapidly progressing disease because we're not going to actually be able to get a patient on a CAR-T in that particular scenario. And so I, my feeling is, is that, you know, there's probably more heavily pretreated, uh, rapidly, kinetically rapidly progressing disease in patients that enroll on bispecific trials than CAR-T, which can also impact outcomes as well. You know, we asked a whole bunch of questions that were not shown tonight, Saad, but, uh, one of we asked a lot of questions about high risk, but I didn't show them because, because uh, people view it kind of similarly in terms of activity. So, is it your take in general with both bispecifics and CAR T that the responses seem like they're very similar in high risk and low risk patients? Uh, yes, I think you know our, our general impression is that you know we don't get the same bang for the buck. Uh, you know, with either strategy for our, you know, high risk and ultra high risk patients. And this is where, you know, we need, uh, you know, newer approaches, maybe combining, you know, by specifics or, you know, cars that are dual targeting might, might be something, you know, beneficial. Maybe some of the new cell mods might work better for, you know, um, some high risk subsets. We need to, you know, figure that out. It's still an area of unmet need. So uh, Kamal in the chat room has an interesting thought, Hans. Can you sandwich bispecific or can you use bispecific as bridging to CAR-T therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a question that we talk about often amongst ourselves. You know, I think that um, if using a bispecific as bridging, I would uh, recommend or prefer to target with a different antigen than the CAR-T is going to be targeting. So if it's a BCMA CAR-T, targeting with a GP or C5D, targeting by specific or vice versa. And then I think one other note to make is that, you know, there is some theoretical concern about uh, T-cell collection uh, right after a bispecific anti- T-cell antibody prior to CAR-T. So if using a bispecific antibody uh, in, as part of bridging, you know, make sure to use it after the T-cell collection until we get more data on that. Because again, T-cell exhaustion, uh, et cetera, et cetera, could potentially lead to decreased T-cell fitness and a, a, a less um, less viable product. Another question in the chat room, Saad, is, well, we were going to get into this later, but while I remember it from the chat room, the question of where you see bispecifics landing, and obviously people are thinking about it potentially being included as initial therapy, but the question was, do you see it more likely combined with induction therapy or more maybe part of maintenance with an MRD uh, strategy? I, I think it, it probably will be both, but we'll have to figure out the duration of treatment. I don't think that we are going to be, you know, using bispecifics with the continuous therapy model in the frontline or maintenance setting. Um, and, you know, that, that's how we'd be able to mitigate the infection risk. Hans, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that um, all of the above will probably use some in the newly diagnosed upfront and some in the maintenance setting. But I think ultimately, when you use in this type of uh, frontline setting, fixed duration, as Saad alluded to, I think will be the way to go in the future. So, you know, we tried to ask questions, uh, some of them kind of very macro questions, but we know people ask these questions. They ask you all the time. So we decided to ask a bunch of you and see if you say the same thing. One thing, uh, Saad, uh, that we asked about was uh, try to compare, and all this is indirect, but people just want to know kind of what your thoughts are in terms of a BCMA targeted by specifics uh, versus uh, BC, some of the, the teclistamab versus the other BCMA by specifics that are not currently approved. And it looks like, as you were alluding to before, people kind of view that the same. 
a, a couple of people thought that teclisumab might have more uh, CRS toxicity. Uh, do you think that's the case, Saad? I think if, if you're thinking about, well, you know, if, if you compare it with um, uh, most of the other bispecifics, I think uh, they're similar. Um, I think I had uh, shared that Linvo appears to have a lower, uh, you know, CRS rate. I think, Hans, you presented that data uh, at ASCO, if I remember correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That's uh, correct, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it's difficult to, you know, compare, you know, the patient populations. All we can comment is on the neuro numeric nature of the CRS rates. Uh, but across the board, you know, these are mostly grade one. So what, you know, the, the CRS that we really need to, you know, worry about more is the grade two not turning into a grade three. So I think that's, that's where, that's the reason why, you know, I, I feel that it's somewhat similar because the grade two CRS rate, uh, or higher is similar across each of these constructs. So we were talking about uh, CAR T and uh, the fact that you know, people are impressed by response rates, and we actually asked people again in direct comparison how they compare uh, side silta cell to ida cell, and certainly indirectly, silta cell seems to have a terrific uh, response rates. So, Hans, uh, can you comment on why, uh, biologically or pharmacologically, it's hypothesized that you see maybe uh, greater effects, and also? Uh, what about uh, side effects and uh, immune-related side effects? Yeah, I think that the prevailing theory is that, you know, because of the 2B semi binding domains on silta cell, this could lead to greater anti-tumor activity. Also, the cell dose with silta cell is quite lower than that of ida cell. And so uh, this is another um, aspect of the differences between silta cell and ida cell. So ida cell only has one B semi binding domain. Uh, but in terms of, uh, toxicities, uh, you know, the kinetics of CRS onset and ICANN's onset are different between the two products. And Ida cell, uh, typically has an earlier onset of you know, CRS, whereas the median time onset with Solta cells are about seven days or so, which kind of implication on the, the practical administration of the treatments. But then we're also seeing some of the late neurotoxicity events uh, with Silta cell, both in the clinical trials, but also in practice as well, uh, which is something we probably see a little bit less with Ida cell. So um, uh, this is probably maybe one reason why in an older frail patient, I might favor Ida cell over Silta cell, uh, just from a toxicity standpoint um, uh, in my own personal practice. So, had any comments on that, and also any updates in terms of the neurotoxicity? The, you know, there was this Parkinsonian syndrome. I think it seems like there's less of it now that it's being uh, used more. But any updates on that? Yeah, I think in clinical practice, you know, we, you know, in the real world, we haven't seen, you know, a a big uh, signal, and and part of that is, uh, I think the. Um, you know, the cyto reduction that we utilize before patients get uh, the CAR T cell therapies. So this is an interesting, actually, again, uh, I mentioned earlier in the chat room, somebody brought up this question of patients who you would consider eligible for bispecifics that you wouldn't send for CAR T. So we asked the faculty to give us examples, and you can see there's a bunch of older patients with comorbidity, 55-year-old patient with ejection fraction of 30%. Um, any uh, comments on this, Hans, and also the question that was in the chat room about specifically uh, cardiac and pulmonary, uh, uh, you know, status and eligibility for CAR T versus bispecifics? You both had a couple of patients. One was on oxygen, another one with a heart uh, disease. How do you uh, think that went through, Hans? Yeah, I mean, I think from this table right here, I, I think patients with rapidly progressing disease. Uh, is where biases make a lot more sense than CAR T just because the time to apherese, uh, manufacture and infuse cells is too long for a patient to practice get, uh, CAR T. I would say that, um, you know, because there does seem to be a, a lower risk for higher grade CRS with bispecifics compared to CAR Ts, that's where I'd favor a bispecific in a frailer patient population, even with an EF of 35% or 40%. Uh, just because, you know, when you get to the grade two or grade three CRS, that's when you have to think about administering IV fluids. Uh, you know, if they have cardiac, uh, 
failure, uh, congestive heart failure, then they may not be able to tolerate some of the uh, interventions to treat uh, higher grade CRS. And so that's where I would say I'd favor the bispecifics. So another thing we were curious about, we always are asking people is put aside regulatory and reimbursement issues like theoretically right now, you know, what do you want to do? And so, of course, one of the big questions here is sequencing and timing. Uh, so in a tri obviously these patients are going to need to be triple refractory, but then the question is uh, how much more therapy beyond initial therapy do they need before you start thinking about a bispecific antibody and which antibody? Uh, and uh, it, most people are sort of into the second relapse, uh, uh, but you bring up the issue of first relapse. Any thoughts, Asad? Yeah, so again, taking that example of, uh, you know, patients who can benefit from um, uh, bispecifics with finite duration of treatment and knowing that BCMA is not lost at subsequent relapses in most, you know, majority of patients who get a BCMA-directed treatment, that's that's where the you know um, the BCMA by specific um, uh, you know kind of makes sense. And I wrote wrote checklist map, but it could be any of the other ones as well. So uh, Hans, uh, this is of course another huge question that uh, people in practice want to know about. What comes first? Certainly, there is as we pointed out, or as you all pointed out, there are advantages to both. Why is it there's unanimity that CAR T in general for most patients should come first, Hans? Yeah, so if, if access wasn't an issue, I think based on available data, we are seeing encouraging responses with bispecific therapy, either targeting BCMA or non-BCMA antigens after CAR T, so over 50% response rates and uh, some of the data with ELRA uh, showing uh, encouraging durations of response. Whereas we have somewhat limited data of CAR T after bispecific, but there is a cohort C of, of CAR T2 uh, uh, published earlier this year, which uh, did demonstrate a pretty significant diminishment of response rates, but also duration response of siltacil after prior beast made targeted therapies and some real world data from the US uh, uh, CAR T uh, consortium, which also showed some diminished responses uh, with uh, CAR T after bispecifics. And so based on that data, I think uh, many of us would prefer if access was an issue CAR T prior to bispecific. Saad, any uh, comments on that? And would you agree that either way, there's not gonna be a plateau on the curve? And if so, why? I think in the relapse situation, we really have not seen that plateau. Um, so, you know, as, as, uh, our, uh, you know, myeloma colleague, Dr. Nina Shah, you know, Shah used to say that we have plateau envy from our lymphoma colleagues. Um, you know, that we haven't seen that plateau. Uh, however, I think, you know, once we start getting to dual targeting treatments, um, you know, things may be different. Um, so we just have to wait and see. So uh, we also asked uh, whether or not people, we've talked before about using CAR-T after bispecific in both, in both ways, and the faculty has done it both ways uh, and seen responses for that matter. We also asked uh, Hans for, for people to describe the last patient they gave us by bispecific to on or off protocol. And you can see most of these patients are older, but Dr. Nuka has a a patient is uh, 49 who got uh, actually interesting on the protocol, teclistamab, daratumumab, really interesting combination being studied. Any thoughts about the spectrum right now, uh, Hans, of who's actually getting the bispecifics and also the sequencing of uh, theoretically that you expect to happen in the future uh, when you have uh, some of these other agents who are non-BCMA uh, bispecifics available? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the great advantage of bispecific is that access, and so you if you need a if you need an effective therapy for a patient, it's available right away. Uh, you know, actually, just to comment a little bit about this patient I described here, and actually, I just got some additional updated response data, and the patient after uh, cycle two is now in a partial response. The response was upgraded. Uh, is that um, this? patient is an elderly patient and uh, doesn't have a caregiver. And so, um, you know, didn't have a caregiver in the peri -CAR -T period. And so she preferred to have a bispecific therapy. And so I think it's just nice that such an option was available for her. She's actually had prior bispecific targeting a different antigen, prior BCMA-ADC therapy, and to see such a response is, is quite encouraging. 
I think in the overall sequencing of therapy, though, to your earlier question, I think we're all very excited about the CARTITUDE 4 data that was presented at ASCO and EHA this past month. And so if, if access and regulatory uh, issues weren't uh, a factor, you know, I think many of us would consider perhaps giving a BCMA CAR-T, such as Siltasol, at first relapse, and then follow it with a non-BCMA targeting uh by specific, or if they have a long duration response, certainly a beast may target device that could be an option as well. Uh, so, you know, potentially that could be one sequence strategy. But in reality, access will be the limiting factor. Access is the, the critical issue. And so I think overall, more patients are going to be treated by specifics uh, nationally and globally just because of this sheer access issue. And these are very effective therapies with the by specifics. And speaking of access, I thought this was very interesting. Uh, we said, tell us about the last patient you gave CAR-T therapy, and almost everybody refers to a patient who got Siltacel. So I don't know, is, it, is access to both of these agents better than it was a year ago, Saad? Because I know there was a point where you all were just saying, just take whichever CAR-T you can get. Yeah, I think earlier this year, maybe you know, three months ago, uh, both the companies have increased um, um, you know their their production capacity and 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 so uh, it's very interesting. You know we we're seeing you know more utilization of um, uh, you know uh, Silta cell compared to Ida cell. You know Hans, I'm not sure what what you're seeing. You know in in your clinical practice. Yeah, I definitely think access has improved in the last year, um, but I think also you know patients may have preferences on what. They would want, you know, in terms of their therapy, whether that be Silta cell or Ida cell. And so we have discussions on the data that talks at both efficacy and, and also safety. And so based on those discussions, patients may have one preference versus another, uh, after such discussions, you know, because access is improving. So a quick chat room question. This is, it sounds like a real RTP type question from Kamal. Can you, uh, briefly summarize your take, uh, uh, Hans? on the median PFS and OS between BCMA CAR-T versus BCMA bispecific at second relapse for patient. Talk about indirect comparison, but what is the indirect comparison? You're saying neither of them have plateaus. Indirectly, how would you compare, let's say, Silta cell PFS and OS versus uh, BCMA bispecific? The Clista map. Yeah, we don't have... Um mature data with BCMA by specifics in, at first relapse compared to the, for instance, CARTITUDE 4 data. I, I would probably expect uh, uh, that the PFS and DUR duration of response may be lower, but at the same time, uh, you know, patient selection can also play a role as well. So I think this is a limitation of doing cross-trial comparisons with by specifics and CAR-Ts because it, re it really comes down to patient selection and which types of patients go on the studies. So that's the, that's the caveat that I would, I would give. So uh, we earlier we were talking about the, the question everybody has, are bispecifics eventually going to be given by general medical oncologists? I'd say there's a consensus that, yes, this, that's going to happen. Uh, also, we uh, asked about sequencing preference, and now that, now that we're looking at these data, I'm thinking maybe it'd be different in people with prior CAR T. But in any event, this is the question we asked. Everybody said to Clistamab before uh, Talquetamab, other than Dr. Krishan. Uh, we asked about a couple of trials that are ongoing, kind of what people thought they were going to show. And of course, uh, uh, Saad, uh, you know, prediction is always has, uh, you know, the hazards. But uh, we said, what do you, there's a trial looking at uh, Dara RVD plus or minus the Clistamab. Uh, and everybody's saying they think it's going to be more efficacious. Um, I'm curious what you think the toxicity profile is going to be. We start adding in a bispecific on top of Dara RVD. Do we, do we have a toxicity safety data? I mean, I assume we do. We have that trial. Yeah, that, that data is not in public domain yet, but I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll, we'll have it either at ASH later this year or early next year, maybe at ASCO. Um, uh, I think, you know, again, the key would be not giving teclistumab the same way it was given, uh, in Majestic One, but, you know, giving it, um, in a different schedule and giving it for a defined period of time. I think that will mitigate, um, you know, the, uh, the infection risk. 
even in the relapsed uh, situation, the time to best response with teclistamab was about three odd months. And that's, I, I feel, you know, Hans, that would be something similar with other DCMA biospecifics as well. And we see the same, same pattern with GPRC5D. Um, so I, you know, if, if you're seeing that in the relapse space, there's no reason to believe we won't see that in the front line. So uh, another trial uh, that's very interesting, we were talking before about bi-specific as part of uh, maintenance. Um, uh, Hans, uh, we were asking people how LRAN is going to compare to lenalidomide, which is actually being studied, and people are pretty optimistic about LRAN. What about the two together, Hans? Yeah, so are you talking about combining a bisphosphate plus lenalidomide? Is, is that what you're asking, Neil? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that would be highly efficacious, you know, especially converting patients with residual disease, uh, MRD positive, MRD negative disease. And so I think that uh, would be highly effective. I think, again, trying to uh, deliver the bisphosphate uh, in an intelligent way, fixed duration probably you know, for sustained memory negativity and then stopping the therapy, I think would probably be the best way to mitigate risk for infection. So we've been talking about uh, some of the trials that are going on, the combinations. Uh, this one sounds really uh, interesting. Uh, Saad, any thoughts about the idea of combining uh, bispecific, in this case, uh, talquetamab with anti-CD38 antibody, in this case, daratumumab? Yes, I think, you know, this uh, speaks to, uh, you know, the possibility that CD38 positive, uh, you know, uh, Tregs and Bregs may be uh, downgrading some of the response and activity of um, the bispecific antibodies. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a good scientific question to ask. And, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, some encouraging data, you know, with that, uh, especially in the Q2 week dosing. Oh, this is my favorite, teclistamab and talquetamab. Hans, any thoughts about that? The redirect TT1 study. Yeah, this was one of the most exciting abstracts at ASCO and EHA. And you know, not only did you see an over ninety percent response rate, ninety six percent to be exact, with the combination at the RPTD, uh, but there were quite a few patients with true extramedullary soft tissue disease that was enrolled on the study. And the responses in extra and major disease were quite impressive uh, with the combination of both teclistamib and talquitinib. And so we're all looking forward to seeing more mature data with this approach uh, with additional patients on the study. Saad, any comments? And also, what do you see tolerability-wise when you combine the two? Is there more CRS? You know, what happens? Uh, so the CRS signal appears to be the same. The infection, at least at the current follow-up, isn't any higher than both of them put together. But, you know, the depth of response is very impressive. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing this, uh, 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 you know, more data with this regimen. I know there are, you know, expansion studies that are going to be looking at uh, the high-risk subsets as well. So... Um... Any comments? Uh, um, this is from your uh, slide deck side on mechanism of resistance to bispecifics. Seems like there are multiple mechanisms. From your point of view, what are the major mechanisms of clinical resistance, Saad? Uh, I, I think the nature of high risk disease and you know proliferative nature of myeloma may get in the way. You know, you're you're just not uh, you know catching up with how quickly the disease is proliferating. But, you know, for the, you know, uh, tumor microenvironment, um, uh, uh, you know, question of, of, uh, you know, immune suppressor cells kind of downgrading the response. I think, uh, this is where the, the, you know, anti C38 combination story may actually play a role. Uh, for T cell functioning, you know, there are clinical trials that are looking at checkpoint inhibition being combined with bispecifics, imids and cell mods being combined. And, you know, so it would be very interesting to see, you know, how the immune profiling data looks like. So we've gotten so many great questions from the chat room. I don't think we're going to get to your cases, but again, check out the presentations. A couple more really great questions uh, coming in. So uh, Hans, Bonnie wants to know what research is being done to predict who will respond uh, to these agents. And uh, David has a very interesting, I'm just going to read it because I'm not really necessarily sure I understand it, but I think I do. Will bispecific antibodies engaging another non-CD3 target 
uh, or when a particular subset of T cells such as CD8 plus uh, cytotoxic cells find its role in uh, myeloma treatment. Uh, so that and how do you pre- any way to predict benefit, Hans? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of work being done to try to predict response to biospecifics. There's a nice paper by Nazar Bayless published in Cancer Cell, I think earlier this year, which basically showed that the baseline T-cell repertoire can help predict responses uh, to bisphate T-cell antibody-based therapy. So I think something in the future would be not necessarily profiling the myeloma cells, but profiling the immune effector cells and do basically immune profiling to see which immune uh, effector cell subsets might be best suited for a particular uh, bisphate antibody, which lends sort of leads to the other question. Yes, there are other uh, bisphate antibodies being developed, for instance, targeting CD16 on NK cells. And so this, there's a lot of excitement targeting other immune effector cells uh, in myeloma uh, beyond just uh, CD3 on the T-cell receptor. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Hans and Saad. We all learned so much uh, from you today. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back Thursday, same time, same place. ER positive metastatic breast cancer. We'll see what Dr. Bardia and Dr. Hamilton have to say, particularly about some of the data just presented at ASCO. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Hans. Thanks, Saad. Bye-bye.